Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And I've got Heather Ferrari with us today. She is a business coach coming out of Utah. And she is she helps clients with revenue revolution, productivity hacks, mindsets. Um, and I'm really happy to have her on the show for the entrepreneurs just to have a 20 to 25 minute fireside conversation around business and business entrepreneurship for the audience. So Heather, welcome. Chris, thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here and be with you and spend a few minutes together today. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoy talking with entrepreneurs and we were talking about how the power of the internet has allowed us to come together and create and share and just influence almost for just the cost of our time. And so talk about you, how you got started and uh, what your company does. And I'm really excited to delve into the conversation. Great. I could definitely talk about myself for a little bit. I'm just kidding. It's it, I, I started in small business. My parents still run a business. It's been going strong for 52 years. And so it was just something that was instilled in me since I was just tiny to run and operate your own business. So of course, the minute that I could run away from that, I did. And I went and worked for somebody else. And then quickly realized that my my parents did have something figured out. So then I went into insurance. I started my own agency at 23 and became very successful doing that and then decided to become a person that recruited and hired and trained in a new territory for the insurance company. So I was in leadership, went back into insur- and running and operating an agency again to retiring from insurance and becoming a mother which was such a wonderful part of my life. And then I jumped into this coaching thing. I worked for a coaching company and then eventually started my own. So I've worked myself opening and operating companies. I've worked for my parents. I've worked for other people. And it seems to always come back to running my own show. My dad would tell you that it's because I'm stubborn and I don't like to listen to anybody, but I don't think that's true. That's a beautiful story. And I love, I was telling my coaching clients, if you're still working for somebody when you're fifties or sixties, there's, it, it's time to start thinking, reframing it and think of it, think about it a different way, either become self-employed or a business owner or investor, uh, sever ties and reduce dependency on someone else. And so I love how you, you had a early head start delving in what one, one thing is talking about is you're a lot of the audience are, they're interested in scaling. So uh, what are some effective strategies you've implemented to help small business owners scale without sacrificing quality or personal time? I would say a lot of times it's a you problem. And what I mean by that is sometimes people aren't taking a step back soon enough to realize that there is a better way. So I would first and foremost encourage anybody that feels like they're about to struggle or been struggling a little bit, don't wait too much longer because normally it doesn't get better. We're in these habits that have got us here. And so unless we have a way to change those, then we're just going to stay here instead of moving forward. And I can say that personally, I've stayed stuck too long in a spot because I didn't ask for help soon enough. And so that would just be a, a big takeaway. But I think a lot of times people think that they are the only thing or the only person that's bringing that quality or bringing that service. And if they're not involved in some way that it's going to fall apart. And that is just like bad thinking because there are great people out there and there are lots of things that we can train people to do that you are still involved, but not in every piece. So you don't necessarily have to be the one taking the intake form or there's so many great automations and so many processes and systems and client management structures out there that can help you with that for a very minimal fee. And so I think it's for every business, it's a little bit different just because they are unique in what they do and how they do it. I think there are great solutions for people to scale if they just take, first of all, breathe, take a step. You're not alone in this. Anyone that's been successful at some point been there. Uh, but also that there are plenty of options. And sometimes that's overwhelming for people as well. And sometimes having a person or calling a few companies or doing a little bit of research could help you decide what would be the best process or system for you. But that's one of the biggest things that you can do is ask for help and then look for things that we can automate. And then the next step would be how do we delegate, right? How do we 
and that's a big one for a lot of people. They delegation is hard. You are now giving up something to somebody. Yeah, and I think that last statement really resonates with the audience who are doctors or lawyers, dentists. They're so used to doing things themselves, and a lot of times I hear that, "Oh, I'll just do it myself; it's easier." Whereas, where they can actually impart that knowledge and train somebody. The other question, because I was talking to an, one of the good founder myself the other day, we're just chatting over coffee, and he was saying like scaling a business, he was like hiring and all these people and then his overhead got higher and like all this stuff. And then I was talking to another founder and she scaled her business through software and automation. So instead of having people, she's got like subscriptions and she's got chat GPT and all these AI assistants. And um, she was telling us that's so much better because it's just, you're just paying for one thing with ultimately infinite productivity. So do you recommend going people versus software, AI automation, where do you see the balance? I think you need both in a lot of ways. And sometimes it also depends on your business. If you are front facing, when you need that person that's available to customer service or your business is actually a brick and mortar still, you might need people. So I don't know if it's like you mentioned, like a doctor or a dentist, like that's front facing. I I, I don't know how AI punch in a number and something comes, I, possibilities are unlimited. But I still think people anticipate to have somebody at the front desk. So I think sometimes it's a little bit of both. I think people tend to hire. I've done it myself, right? Like we're, you just are so tired and exhausted and you're just like, I would just need somebody to fill the spot, take some of this off. But you're so at a capacity point then that when you bring this person on and just throw stuff at them and good luck, that's not a successful plan with them either. And we've all had those people do that to us. If you've been in business at any time, like somebody's just so grateful that you're there. It's take all of this off of me and you don't know what to do. You don't even know how to log in potentially. So it's we. It's not just hiring to fill the void or to take on those responsibilities. Before you hire, I would sit and say, okay, what is it that I would delegate to somebody, right? How do I take these things that I'm feeling what would I delegate? And if it's only a part-time person, then don't be looking for someone full-time. That's where we get out of control with overhead too. And maybe there are things that you could automate. So you wouldn't need to delegate all of it to somebody. You would just need to delegate the automation to them. I always think about it as what's coachable, trainable, teachable, because if we can get those things off of our plates, like a dentist, like I, I wouldn't be able to go into a dentist office and perform the work, but there's are things that I could do to help assist and take some things off of their plate. So I think it's a little bit of both. And I think as the owner, we just have to start to identify what are those things that we would hand off. And in that way, we're building a job description, right? We're actually seeing so when we go to recruit for that person, it's not a question of just take all this stuff. It's these are the things that I need you to do. And I'm going to teach you, train you and coach you on how to do them. And then we can take a step back and enjoy the benefits of having a, a person or an automation in place. Like you said, it's a fine line and a fine balance. And a couple of the podcasts, yes, just before you, and she was saying that a marketing department used to be 20 people. Now it's two people. And now you actually have a CMO who's fractional. So he or she is working for like 10 different companies and there's there's not a full time and which is I love this idea of coachable, teachable, trainable. Moving the conversation forward is talk about revenue growth tactics and you say growing revenue by 50% is bold and share some specific tactics tactics that have been proven successful for your clients in achieving this growth. Some of the biggest success that I've seen with people is when they've removed themselves from the day-to-day. For instance, I have a client that is a roofer, but they're in multiple territories. And he was trying to be the sales guy, be the customer. Like there was just so many roles that he was trying to fulfill and he just didn't want to let go. And I totally get that. But when he was able to do that and train someone to do sales in his process that worked, it's funny. He calls, he's I'm not putting as many miles on my vehicles anymore. I'm like, that's a good thing. And so sometimes it that's profit too, right? Not to destroying a vehicle because you're not in it as much because you have people out there still bringing in the revenue, but it's just not you. And so to get him to understand that it's if you can make yourself duplicatable, 
but have a way to monitor it. So he, he was still looking at stats. He's still looking at success of the lead coming in versus it being closed, making sure they're following up through the, the follow-up process. But that's more of a leadership entrepreneur CEO role than I'm the one knocking on the door. And I think sometimes we, again, we're just so used to doing the same thing over and over again that it's hard to imagine it being a different way. I can't speak on his behalf for sure, but I would probably say that he does feel like he has more time. He does feel like he's got some great people on board, that he has systems in place and processes to monitor the success. And in turn, he went from less than a million a year to over 5 million a year. And so I think that's a huge growth in just a short amount of time by tweaking small things. But sometimes just removing yourself is the best way to bring your company profit because you're only one person and growth, profit and growth. Yeah, so well said. It reminds me of uh, my early days. I was like, I was, uh, they were saying, it was this, the saying is um, jumping over dollars to get the pennies. And I was really like struggling and just wasting my time. And uh, when I re- when I realized what you just said, it was like letting go of the, like the, the small things and like really focusing on the big things. And then that's when the revenue and income started to, really come in um, and just working less too, which was, it's almost like a, it's like a epiphany. It's like counterintuitive. So, Isn't the best part too of why you want to own your business is so that you can actually do stuff with your life. It's like, oh, I have all this free time and I'm making more money. And it's, they almost feel like it's wrong in some way. Though this is like how it should be. <laughs> this is how it should yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dad, yeah. I love what you just said. And so next thing is just talking about just because I know we have around seven, eight minutes left and you have the youth family and being a mother is really important to you. And so navigating challenges as a female entrepreneur and what unique challenges have you faced and how have you had to uh, overcome them to become the uh, mother and the entrepreneur that you want to be? That is such a powerful question, Chris. So I appreciate that you ask that because even in my own family, my sisters are stay-at-home mothers. And so for me, it's almost like if I I should be doing that because that's the norm. And so for a lot of it, it's just like a mind shift because I know that's not what I was intended to do. And it's not knocking anything. I'm just more like, I got to be busier and not that my moms aren't busy, but it was a different busy. I need to be involved in business. I need to be involved in those things. And so how did I create something that I could do both? Because I, of course, love being a mother and I also love helping people. So how do I make that work for most days? And I retired for that reason. When my daughter was little, I did want to spend that time. So I took about two years off just to be with her. And then I went back to it when she went back to school because it was like, what am I going to do now? And I think that for me, I just had to put on a different identity that felt real to me and not the shame that comes with being a a mother and a working mother. Like I made it very clear to the schools that my daughter went to, don't ask me to serve on all these boards. I'm, I'm not going to do it. I will give you money, hands down. If you need me for two holidays a year, I will be there. I'll have my daughter pick and that's what I'm going to do. And it was setting those boundaries instead of saying yes to everything and then hating all of it and not being in, not having it be enjoyable. But I was still there for my daughter. Like she saw me there. She, I was happy to be there. And so we had a compromise that way. So I, I guess just setting up boundaries for myself to where I could still do something that I loved and be present when I needed to be present. I see in a, even in a lot of my clients that are female entrepreneurs is They're trying to do so many things. And when they come down to it, they're like, yeah, I don't really need to be doing that, but I just feel like I have to. Let's let's question those things because the have to part, feeling like that, there's guilt, there's shame. Let's get rid of all of that and then actually do the things that are going to bring even more intensity and value to your family and to your day to day than trying to make everybody else happy. Because that's a failing plan, no matter if you're a female male, it's the same, right? If you're trying to make everybody happy, you're the miserable person at the end of the day. So boundaries are super important in my schedule. I live and die by that. Yeah, it's the, that's the, almost the, I've heard about the schedule and basically you can see how successful somebody is going to be by looking at their schedule and just because it's just basically ex- once you get in your calendar, it's like just execution. That's a great coach that taught me the power of your schedule. Um, 
How can you? There's no shortage of getting yourself organized. <laughs> That's the, especially in today's technology, there's no shortage of that. It just takes a little bit more of an effort up front to enjoy those rewards day to day, week to week, month to month. Yeah. Yeah. How can people find you and follow you and reach out to you and find out more about the work that you do? Oh, gosh. Thank you so much. They can find me. My website is heatherferrari.com. I'm also on TikTok. It's at Heather underscore Ferrari. I'm on Instagram as well. So check me out on those platforms. I do post some leadership videos almost daily. So there's some cool tips and tricks on there to learn a little bit more about how I'm helping people. Yeah, I really like that. And for the audience, be sure to give Heather's socials a like and follow and really enjoy this conversation. And thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thank you, Chris. I enjoyed it as well. Thank you again.